Before we get started today, I'd like to quickly introduce our speakers, Erica Podesta-McCoy, Tim Heisdew, and Jeff Holland. Erica Podesta-McCoy, Chief Marketing Officer at Resonate, is a global marketing executive experienced in building brands, facilitating growth, and driving revenue in a multitude of sectors across North America, Europe, and Asia. Tim Heisdew, Executive Director of SaaS at Resonate, helps companies make sense of the complex MarTech landscape and drive more growth and efficiency through technology across industries. Jeff Holland, Senior Solutions Engineer at Resonate, is a deeply experienced SaaS, ad tech, and MarTech sales engineer with a long history of building and driving data-driven marketing solutions for clients in the ad agency and brand spaces. And now, as we have a great conversation on tap today, I'll hand things over to Erica. Thanks, Brian. It's great to be here. Hope you guys are enjoying the fleeting days of summer. What a year it has been so far. A sea of change for consumers, really, um, starting at the very, very beginning of the year. And a sea of change for brands as well. A look at the headlines, obviously, you know, crisis in America um, and really globally setting off a, a global crisis around social justice, um, conflict in our cities, um, reactions, and brands left to respond with how do they address this type of issue? Everything from GAP, um, calling for youth activism, uh, to Patagonia, um, looking for ways to take a stand on um, COVID, even banks and the concept of having roles of chief diversity officers um, coming about, Columbia Sportswear tapping perhaps a, 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 an athlete that was controversial in one way or another as their brand ambassador. And various retailers taking a stand from Whole Foods, Costco, Walmart, um, requiring masks, requiring six feet distance. Brands really leaning in to a very dramatic year. To say it was turbulent is certainly an understatement. And it has left our consumers and quite frankly ourselves battered. And for marketers, for brand marketers, for agencies that are supporting their clients, it really can feel like this, right? Here we are. What is coming next in terms of the tidal wave that we have to react to? And how are we supposed to react given these times? It's really about getting back to the humans that are in your audience, understanding how these consumers, voters, your customers, are evolving as a result of everything happening around them? And who are they at the core? And how does that core drive what they do? So this human element is this concept of everything that makes up a person, their demographics, their psychographics, but also the, the motivations and values that they hold dear that show how they're going to react to the things that are happening around them. And so in the spirit of that, at Resonate, we have an annual report that we call the State of the Consumer. It's our benchmark report on what's happening with the consumer. When we kicked off 2020, we were really, really excited about this idea of it's not really just the state of the consumer. It's the state of the voter. It's the state of your customer. And we did so because it was going to be a presidential election year. Well, little did we know that on top of this presidential election year, we would be thrust into the midst of a global pandemic and then thrust again to the midst of, of a, a fight for racial justice um, that's really caught fire. And so now more than ever, this idea of a consumer activist is incredibly relevant today. So we explore an audience that we like to call a segment that we've created called consumer activists. These are people who pay more based on important issues. They shop based on important issues and they prefer brands that, that are aligned to their issues. And so it's not, you know, perhaps it's not who you would expect it to be. Interestingly enough, when we look at the, the age group and we're starting to set the foundation of who these, who these, these people are as humans, they, there's a mix of ages. It's not just there's a, there's a bulk of people that are, are, are college age, you know, early 20s, but there are also people at various stages. It's not just millennials or Gen X, Gen Y, Gen Z, and also, you know, leaning into older generations. And it's not just, you know, people who have a lot of free time for, for, um, fighting, you know, certain, certain taking time to protest or whatnot. These are people at all different economic spectrums that have time to um, invest towards spending their money in a certain way. 
And they're people with different educational backgrounds. So there's definitely some students that we talked about in there, but also people who have graduated from college and whatnot. Um, you really want to understand the core of who these consumer activists are. And so we talked a little bit about who they are, and they don't look the same. They don't make the same amount of money. They, they aren't all from the same sort of economic background. But so then how, what unites them? What is the core? Um, what values do they share? And so we start there with values. They actually have some in common, accepting those who are different is a core value for them. Leading an exciting life and maintaining a good public image are really important for these consumer activists. So you can start to get a picture of someone who is active in social media, who is feeling, wants, wants their friends and their peers and perhaps their coworkers to know that they care about these issues that they're educated on certain issues and that they are ready to take stands on issues. And they have very strong feelings about the brands that they prefer. Um, energy use and sustainability is very important to them. And so reduced energy use, reduced packaging, very important. And then, of course, brands that listen to the public, very important to them. Now, what they expect brands to engage with are going to be different than other types of consumers. These consumer activists care about promoting civil liberties. They are pro-choice in many cases. They care about those types of issues. And they also even care about things like improving mass transit and the well-being right, uh, in urban areas. And no surprise, when you think about what this, these brands that these people may really care about, Patagonia, a brand that's taken a very active stand in terms of sustainability and the environment and Whole Foods, you know, another brand that is um, aligned to these issues are brands that are their favorites. Now, these consumer activists are people that are definitely online, but also offline. So we look at their media consumption and start to understand if I were a brand, where would I find them? Where can I reach them? They are big American horror story watchers. Um, amongst other things. So some new, some old, Grey's Anatomy. So for those of you right watching things on demand, um, tidying up with Marie Kondo and NCIS. So a variety of TV shows that they watch. TV networks like HGTV are important to them. And they spend quite a few hours online. So we're looking anywhere from 10 to 40 hours online each week. They also are consuming their TV on tablets. So you know there are people that are in app, watching in app, not watching on standard, no linear TV for these folks. So thinking about the choices that you might make of ways to reach these people, you can use this type of information, their online and offline media consumption to reach this diverse audience. Even when you look at things like magazines that they're, they're reading or newspapers that they're reading, they do read the Washington Post, New York Times, right? Newspapers that tend to write in-depth articles about these things. They have different uh, interests in Pinterest, Twitter, but also LinkedIn. So for those still in the working years, right, very active on LinkedIn. And more and more people are getting this type of activism information on LinkedIn, not just on Twitter anymore. When you look at the apps that they use, no surprise, there's, you know, travel apps are very popular even now still, but also business tools and productivity, entertainment and lifestyle but much, much less likely to be interested in things like, you know, food and drink and other apps. So there's a lot of information here into where you can put your brand to align to these consumer activists, online and offline, so digitally speaking. Now, where do they live physically speaking? Interestingly enough, when you look at the data, a lot of these consumer activists are found in the Northwest. And when you think of some of the things that we're seeing in the headlines, in some of the areas like Portland and whatnot, it's probably not that big of a surprise that these consumer activists in these various age groups are in this area of the country, which really helps you when you're trying to understand your own consumer and prospect base. When we look at product preferences, they really care about products that are produced sustainably and that are energy efficient. They over-index substantially and a big bulk of them care about these things. If your product is produced sustainably or is energy efficient, and you're not communicating it to these consumer activists, you're missing out on really important messaging that's going to make a difference when they choose your brand. Now, when we really try to understand this landscape, we recognize that there's not even one homogeneous group of consumer activists. Within there, we also have a, a segment that we found 
called the Resonate Equalizer. Very similar to the activist, but different in some very important ways. And if you're a brand and you're trying to reach and engage these people in your customer base and beyond, it's really important to understand the differences that you, they, you will see. Now their personal values are really around, no surprise, top value, treating people equally, accepting those who are different. And interestingly, obeying laws and fulfilling obligations. These values are where their decision-making is driven from. And a lot of times in advertising, we talk about emotions, but really values are the core that we hold that, that really all of our decisions spring from and therefore where our emotions then come from. Now, when we look at brands that they prefer, they care about treating employees fairly. No surprise when you see how much they care about the people component. They want to see brands that support their community and obviously those that listen to the public. So some things similar, some things are different. Now, when you think about areas to engage, whether you wanna align your core values or your brand values, or if you're going to take a stand on something, engagement areas like promoting gender and race equality or gay and lesbian equality are very important to this audience, as well as pro-choice issues. And the brands that they are some of their favorite brands, and some, of course, not across all categories, but just for a flavor, Reebok and CVS, very interesting, both brands that have taken an active stand, very dramatic active stand in terms of um, racial equality. And, and even when you think about CVS and, the, and some of the programs they offer um, with caring for uh, people, making sure that they're presenting um, fair advertising, you know, they're a favorite brand of the equalizer. And so they care about these things. When you look at the index, 32% of, of this base say equality is important, that they're treating employees fairly. So your programs of how you're treating employees during COVID-19, um, you know, did you give them extra uh, pay or vacation, sick time, right? All of those things, when you think about Whole Foods and some of the pushback that was given to that brand, this equalizer cares a lot about treating employees fairly, supporting the community, and again, taking a stand for local issues, and of course, listening to the public. Now, when we look at these audiences like consumer activists and within the consumer activists, this, this equalizer brand, brands are trying to decide, how do I react? What is core to who I am as a brand? What is the right move to make? You can see brands like Aunt Jemima, Uncle Ben, and others changing the iconic figures that have represented their brand. Brands like Goya, um, where the CEOs stand, cause backlash from their customers. It just underscores how important it is to understand your customers, not just this consumer activist segment, but which of your customers and prospects are part of this consumer activist segment. And so we do a ton of research. Um, we may have seen other webinars of ours. We, have, we are now in our seventh wave of COVID-19 pandemic research. Um, so we have the latest, freshest data on how the U.S. consumer is responding amid the pandemic. But we've also done a great deal of research on social activism, um, Black Lives Matter, uh, Facebook and other issues. And so one of the questions that we asked is, how likely are you to react when you see a consumer brand showing support for Black Lives Matter? Now, when we asked this question, and you can see two waves of data here, we found that 28% say they're more likely to purchase from a brand that supports Black Lives Matter. Interestingly enough, this is down 32 from 32% in early July, late June, early July. Just as interesting is that there's 30% of people who say they're less likely to purchase from a brand who support Black Lives Matter. So where do your customers stand on this issue? Where do your prospects stand on this issue? It's so important to understand where consumers are today and how they feel about your brand. How do I know all this information? We are in market continuously serving, re serving real humans with the largest national consumer study, including things like the research that I've, I've asked and I've mentioned. We take all of this online, we take all this online behavior and combine it with the survey using AI and machine learning to really get at this deep human element, 200 million consumer profiles with more than 13,000 attributes attached to them. 
Now, it's very easy to take this data and bring it into your own platform, apply it to understand your customers. This data gives you the who, what, when, where, and why people decide to do what they do, whether it's voting, buying, protesting, supporting your brand, or abandoning your brand. And all this research is now wrapped with COVID-19 research and social justice research across all these industries to support your needs. Why is this important today? Today, more than ever, you need to know your customers and prospects, and you need to be able to be agile. So this agile decision-making is driven by the best data. You can take your first-party data and easily bring it into the Resonate platform, whether it's your loyalty program, website traffic, uh, e-commerce purchase data and understand all of that I've described to you about your very customers. That gives you the ability to understand and act. What stores should you open or close? What kind of operational changes do you need to make or changes to the experience that people expect today? If you think about retailers, there are things like curbside pickup, which are going to become table stakes for retailers. How do you know if that's fundamental to your customers? What types of new products and services need to be offered given where consumers are today? How do you retain and prevent churn during these times when there's a lot of new competition? And of course, creative messaging and offers need to be tailored to where people are at this moment based on the experiences that they're having in the market. So let's apply all of this to real use cases. I'm gonna turn it over to Tim that's gonna talk you through an interesting scenario about baking. Great. Thank you, Erica. Um, as Erica said, uh, I'm going to be talking through fall baking season. So for those of you that have been on a webinar with me before, you know that I like to kind of pick an industry, pick a kind of consumer profile that is top of mind, that's relevant, and then just dive really deeply and try to give you some answers, some insights, and then ultimately some advice on some actions that you can take. So planning for fall baking season. Right? Even though the average consumer hasn't really started to think about fall baking, all of us in marketing, you know, and those of you in the CPG industry in particular, are starting to plan for that fall baking season. So as I started to kind of think about that and put myself in the shoes of our clients, I started with some things that I already know about the customer and the things that they've changed. Right? So we know that the customer, you know, average consumer is spending more time at home and more time online. They're cooking more frequently, but for fewer people, meaning that they're not having as many people come to their home. Traveling has radically reduced, so they're not bringing those baked goods to other people's homes. And finally, the underlying shopping habits where people go to buy all the various ingredients that they want to make those um, different recipes, that all has changed, and we have to take that into context to answer the most important question, which is how do I create a meaningful connection with the type of customer that I'm familiar with, but is still very different? So I started kind of going down this thought process. And as Erica talked about, you know, the platform, we have a lot of different data on the left-hand side here. You see uh, things around baking. And on this right-hand side here, we have all the things, some of which Eric talked about, Erica talked about, related to values and activism. So as I was trying to wrap my mind around what would be useful for the audience today, I thought what we need to do is really cluster these two data sets together. So I want to look at the people that bake at least once a week, but I also want to see if activism, some of those characteristics that Erica talked about, have any influence. And so I took these two kind of seemingly disparate data sources, these 18.1 million people that bake at least once a week, and these 68.2 million people that engage with two out of five of the following. So they do two of those. So they shop based on important issues and they research products. So they follow brands and products on social media and share those opinions on social media. What came out is this 9.1 million what I'm calling the live to bake activist. So kind of using that, uh, that profile as a backdrop, I can start to ask my five whys, right? So the things that I wanna uncover from a research perspective is, is who are these people and what makes them unique? 
Uh, what are their psychographics, values, motivations, etc.? cetera? Uh, when do they shop? When do they snack? All these things that are gonna provide me intelligence so that I can take some meaningful action. Uh, where, as Erica talked about, where do they live, work, and play? You know, extend that to online. What are they watching online? What are they watching offline? Um, why do they bake, kind of digging under the hood of who these people are? Why do they choose certain products and prefer certain products over the others? And why would they do business with certain companies? We ask ourselves all these questions so that we can answer the most important, which is the how. This is the action taking part. This is, you know, what do I do? How do I reach them? What do I say to them? How do I keep them loyal? How do I get that incremental spend? All of those things that you're tasked with doing from a uh, taking consumer market research and, and making it actionable uh, and meaningful for your brand. So to answer kind of the who they are, I thought it would be a meaningful comparison. And I really just started by creating the baseline of just live to bake. So these are people that bake, um, you know, at least once a week, because the, the fundamental question from a data perspective that I was trying to answer is what role, if any, does activism play in the, the psyche of the average person that, that bakes once a week. And what we're seeing here really surprised me. So when we look at the top of kind of, you know, what gets them out of bed in the morning and what keeps them up at night, I expected these actually to be much more uh, closely aligned because we're, we're doing a, a comparison of seemingly at the surface kind of similar data sets here. But what we see is that actually these folks are 3.7 times more likely to uh, be intrinsically driven by the ability to show abilities and being admired, acquiring wealth. We see themes of uh, creativity a couple of times pop in there. Uh, as it relates to kind of how they live their lives, this kind of stuck out at me. You know, when I was in my baking mindset, I wasn't thinking about the outdoors. I wasn't necessarily thinking about things like living a healthy lifestyle and a gym membership. And what the data showed me here is that is actually highly relevant and unique to this audience. Digging under the hood of that, so I had showed you the top three personal values. As Erica talked about, and I think this is so important to drive home, is that you know these intrinsic values are what motivate people to take action and, and it underlies a lot of the decisions that they make, whether they know it or not. So diving into the, uh, you know, what makes these live to bake activists a little bit different from the average baker, we see those themes of creativity, achievement, and influence. So, you know, from an action taking perspective, if you're one of the people charged with creating copy or creating imagery, um, and you're trying to create that connective tissue between your brand and your products and your company and these folks, you're going to want to use themes like being admired, appreciated, prestige, innovation, originality, cleverness. These are all going to help you draw a, a stronger connection. Uh, getting more tactical, kind of what are they baking? You know, so I was thinking the imagery, if I had to put something on a box or on a banner ad or on a website, you know, what are these consumer activists baking most often? You know, so I just kind of stack ranked them and said, okay, of, uh, you know, of all the things they've baked in the last week, what are they baking most often? So, you know, all things being equal, if I were gonna run an ad or if I were going to serve up some copy or some imagery or think about product development, you know, I'm gonna show things like cookies and cakes way before I'm showing things like pastries and buns and rolls. Cause we can see that 78% of this 9 million, you know, have done cookies and 72 cakes and you can start to kind of walk down. Uh, they're doing all these things, but again, we're talking about incremental differences in, in how you can separate yourself from your competition here. Next thing I wanted to look at is now that we know what they're baking, I wanted to know, all right, we saw cookies at the top. When are they snacking on these? You know, so as I can kind of put myself in their shoes. And what we see is that these activist bakers, compared to just the average person that bakes once a week, they're 42% more likely to be snacking in the afternoon. They're 16% more likely to be snacking on those cookies post-dinner. And interestingly, they're 4% less likely than average to be snacking on cookies in kind of that mid-morning. This you know, kind of went against what I thought I was going to find from a data perspective on, on these particular uh, consumers. You know, kind of going the who, what, when, where, why, I wanted to dive into some of our COVID research and look at these folks and say, uh, you know, when will they be comfortable shopping? 
And so one of the questions we ask as part of our survey is, you know, what will make you feel comfortable shopping? You can see the top here is that live to bake activist. Uh, and the, uh, that kind of burnt sienna color is our baseline. And what we can see is that 16% are more likely to say that they would insist on having some type of contactless payment option if they were going to go into a grocery store. So, you know, if you're a grocery store, that's going to have a specific meaning to you. If you're a company like Hershey's or Nestle or any of the companies trying to sell those products through those stores, it gives you a meaningful data point to go in and talk to those stores and say, hey, do you have contactless payment? This is important to your customers and our mutual customers. For those that aren't going into the store, I wanted to look at, all right, of some of the different, um, you know, alternatives to shopping that have sprung up, what are the most popular? And I thought this was very interesting and, and really actionable. So, you know, as we start to see people not going to stores and they want more things brought to their homes, this is very, very uh, a stark contrast. Uh, and so what we're seeing here is that these activists are 42% more likely to say that they'd be willing to start a uh, meal kit delivery, 35% more likely than the average uh, fall baker to say that they'd be interested in starting a, a food delivery service subscription. So again, all these things kind of help us understand who these people are, and it helps us create offers that might entice them to, to try something either that they've never tried before or buy more of our product. Lastly, kind of the where before we jump into the why. Jeff will talk about more of this as he gets into his use case, but I thought I'd touch on you know, where these people are going online. We know folks are spending a lot more time online. For this particular audience, 68% of them are very heavy social media users. Uh, we kind of have an index ranking here on the bottom that kind of breaks out the different social media channels. So uh, all things being equal, they're almost three times as likely than average to be on sites like TikTok, 1.3% uh, more or times more likely to be on sites like LinkedIn, uh, Facebook. One of the things that I've kind of learned about Facebook and one of the things most marketers know by this point is that a lot of folks are on Facebook. That's great, but there's really not a lot of differentiation that you're going to draw by targeting on Facebook because you're simply kind of hitting everybody, but so is everybody else. I wanted to dig in a little bit deeper and kind of give you some insights into where these people are going uh, outside of the online channels. So I looked at the recipe websites they are using. Uh, some of the things that popped were Target as well as you know some online publishers like Country Living. Not only are folks going to these sites, but then I also analyze what we call kind of the quality of visitation index, which is a an index that we look to to measure you know just engagement across different sites so these numbers what they mean to you is you know for that qvi that quality of visitation index these activists these live to bake activists are 3.6 times more likely to be found on Kraft heinz uh, recipe website seven times more likely on target and 1.6 on on you know country living This is kind of an interesting data plot where, you know, we talk about why people bake. I talked about, and Erica had talked about that importance of personal values and, and how those intrinsic drivers lead us to make uh, different decisions. And sure enough, this plays out. So what you're looking at here is uh, low index and low composition here on the bottom left high index, high composition here on the bottom right. And I asked, you know, what are the top reasons why these people bake? What we see is that they are 37% more likely to say they bake as a creative outlet, which I just thought was so uh, such a confirmation of what we found in the uh, personal values. You know, number two, baking for the simple pleasure of it. And again, if we're looking at things like conversion efficiency and we're looking at a cost savings uh, kind of play, what I would suggest from these data is that that is going to be a less efficient conversion mechanism to talk about saving money you're going to have more conversion efficiency when you talk about things like uh, using baking as a creative outlet and for the pleasure that it brings. Quickly, we're talking about the why still. So I think it's important to hit on the words that people use to describe that the products they like to buy. We see some common themes here, produce sustainably, popular, fun and exciting. On the flip side of that coin, we see the three things that they're less likely to be enticed by. Things like luxurious, dependable, 
things like trustworthiness are going to be less likely to, to influence these people to, to make a purchase. Finally, before I wrap up, kind of looking at uh, beyond the products themselves, what do these people expect from the companies that they support? So we ask people specifically, you know, when you consider the companies and whether to purchase their products or services, I want you to give me the top three characteristics that are most important to you. So for those 9.1 million live to bake consumers, these are the top three things that, that popped. So they wanna know that the companies that they buy products from support the communities that they live in. They wanna know that they're not just supporting the communities, but they're, they're treating their own employees fairly. And then they also wanna know that those companies are giving back. So if you saw on my previous slide with the country living, they actually have a direct link to the American Red Cross. They're doing the right types of things, showing that they are donating to charities. And those types of things are going to have an impact on, uh, on, on people's willingness and uh, advocacy for your products and services. Kind of wrapping it all up, today we answered these questions. You know, so kind of starting with the, the question in mind, how do I create a meaningful connection with a new type of consumer, a, a new potential customer? If we're trying to go after these 9.1 million live to bake activists, we know that they're driven by a sense of achievement and they want to express their creativity through baking. Uh, they're baking cookies and cakes and they're open to innovative ways of shopping and different types of delivery and service subscription um, ideas. Uh, they're most likely to be snacking in the afternoon and, and after dinner. They're heavy social media engagers, and they're frequently going to different recipe websites as well as retailer websites. And ultimately, when you think about the design and the products and kind of the four P's of marketing, you know, these folks want fun and exciting products that are, that are produced sustainably, and they want those products from businesses that are a part of their communities treat their employees fairly, and also give back to charities. So that was quite a bit to cover. I hope you found that useful. Jeff is gonna kind of take, um, take the torch from me here now and, and talk about an agency use case and kind of explore some of the more things that uh, Eric and I explored. So Jeff? Thanks, Tim. Yeah, so what we wanted to look at from an agency perspective is being able to not only being able to create that uh, meaningful message, but how do we get it out to your potential customers? And what we really wanted to look at is kind of going after those electric electronic considerers. And as what we have been resonating, we have multiple ways to get down to our specific research. And one of those solutions that we wanted to look at was actually looking at our contextual audiences. So being able to pull in custom audiences around those specific topics um, that people are reading or searching about um, to bring in, to start to gain some insights. And from that electronic consider, we wanted to look at people who are reading about digital cameras, tablet computers, smartwatches, people who are doing that research to potentially buy, but also being able to layer on our actual COVID research of people who are avoiding physical stores to a very large extent, that they're not ready to go back and do in-person shopping. So how can we still reach this specific audience with a meaningful message and what channels are they on so we can start to strategize that media plan and execution to go after these individuals. And the first thing we want to start with is, you know, all right, what do they kind of, what do the electronic considerers really care about? You know, really, you know, as Tim mentioned in his previous uh, 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 data slides, is looking at those personal values, you know, what's really going to help start creating that language on how we go out and talk to these individuals, which I'll go here in a second. But then outside of that, what do they care about for those individuals who are not just reading about electronics? What do they care about? What are their top hobbies? What are their daily routine? Which can really get incorporate into that segmentation strategy and help drive that creative content of how you wanna make that connection with these particular individuals. So going into one, again, what makes them unique? And looking at this, you know, starting from the personal values is really helping our agency partners deliver that message to really make sure that these individuals can capture the attention of their consumer. What goes into their thought process on a day-to-day -day perspective? So when we're looking at influence, you know, we want to start incorporating those particular themes of prestige or prosperity or power. Also the creativity, putting this, you know, the innovation, originality, these particular themes within our message because we know this is what's going to capture our consumers or our customers to really make them take action. 
But even going one step below further, we want to look at personal value from that tech perspective. You know, when looking at personal tech, what is something that they really consider? And what we can see from a top attribute is that safety is what's really, really important. And as what that allows us to now want to do is that these individuals are really concerned about preserving their identity, which has never been more apparent in the, the uh, environment that we are in right now. And they want to make sure that what they're utilizing is going to secure all of their data. And we can start to now incorporate around awareness and assuredness to incorporate these on top of creativity and within uh, acquiring influence and putting this all into our language to make sure that we can really deliver that meaningful message to those particular individuals. But then what goes into the thought process? Now we need to figure out what types of, you know, now we have the idea and we have the language, but what types of, what kind of attributes are these uh, individuals looking for from a product perspective? They're really looking for something that's very innovative and something that's also practical and basic. So what kind of products we want to put in? We want to show something that has, um, again, you know, looking into something that's new, that's something that's uh, going to give them something that they haven't had before from that innovation standpoint, but also something that's easy to use, something that they want to be able to utilize on a day-to-day -day basis. So now we can say, all right, these are the types of products that we want to be able to target them um, with in our messaging to go after and say, hey, we know that you're looking at smartphones, you're looking at um, tablets. These are the types of products that are really going to fit that are this is something that's new and being able to utilize that within our messaging as well. But now we kind of want to get into is like, all right, we have the language, we have the messaging. Now we need to figure out, start developing our media plan of where do we want to go out and find these individuals? And what we can start with from that geo perspective, what DMAs and what markets are our top individuals that we should be going after? And we can see in the Bay Area over indexing at 58% more likely to be falling in this category of people who are consuming electronics that are looking to consider to buy compared to Sioux City, which is much less likely to be that, uh, that customer that you directly want to go after. So now this kind of starts of creating that campaign of like, all right, now we can figure out from a geo perspective where we actually want to target those specific messages. And as Tim alluded to earlier, it's like now we need to figure that online, that online engagement presence. What are they doing? And where are they? And from just hours online per week, we can kind of start to see that more than 50% are spending 20 to 40 plus hours a week online, which is great. So now we know that they're online, where else can we find them? And in, in, in tandem though, we're looking at social media networks, we're looking at their social media engagement and compared to those active, those, uh, active bakers, these ones are very less likely to have that real engagement on social media. And from looking at our top social media networks, nothing is really, differentiating our audience compared to our specific contenders. So we know that maybe social is not something that we want to focus on for these brands, but we know online is important. So maybe display and video is what's really important for these particular initiatives. But now we're going to figure out what other channels could be potentially on. How are they consuming TV? You know, are they big TV consumers? And we can see, you know, roughly a bulk of them are, are not really, or just slightly over indexing, but I know there are a good amount that are just watching TV just from like an adjusted uh, time-adjusted uh, box or DVR, and a little bit slightly over-indexing from consuming it from a TV tablet as well. Where are they watching these? So coming into this specifically is what TV shows are they specifically watching? And so what we can now take away from this is from maybe we want to start running some OTT campaigns. We want to start getting an idea, all right, we don't want to just run it across all of network. We want to get an understanding of what apps should we be focused on if we're going to start running those branding campaigns or those pre-roll campaigns to our particular uh, individuals. And so we can see with CNN and PBS, these are significantly over-indexing with a very significant composition compared to the Food Network, which is under-indexing and probably not an air, uh, app that we want to be focused on when we're actually running those OTT campaigns. Let's try other channels. You know, you know, we're in the electronics business and you know that people are definitely have apps and utilizing their smartphone. Is if we want to give like a, a download coupon campaign, so we want to start running an in-app campaign, what apps are they utilizing? And so within this, we can start to now create that strategy and saying, hey, food and drink is something that's over-indexing that we might want to, if we want to run those download, those coupon download campaigns, these are the apps that we should be focused on instead of just running across networks. So this will really kind of uh, make sure that we are hitting, utilizing your uh, budget more efficiently to make sure that we're driving that message to the right audience that we know that they're going to see. And also, why are they watching live sports? We know that one of their, uh, their top um, hobbies is watching online sports, but what are the reasons why? So now what we can start to, again, is we can start to incorporate why they're starting to watch these into our messaging. 
Um, they care about their teams and players. This is part of their daily routine. And so now when we're utilizing electronics, we can incorporate this into our message. People stream your favorite, come stream your favorite teams and watch your favorite players get back to being that fan that's so important to your daily routine. We can now incorporate this into our messaging and into our targeting specifically. So today what we've answered is kind of how do we target that meaningful message and where do we find them? You know, who are those consumers that are reading about these new personal uh, tech devices that are avoiding those physical stores? We found out the who, but what do they kind of really care about? You know, they want something that's really innovative and they want something that's a product that can provide that prestige or importance. Where are they? We learned that they have a heavy online presence, but they're not really heavy on social media. So we know that we want to kind of focus more on that display and programmatic or the video. Um, and then we know that they like to watch sports online. And then also why they want to they want safety in their lives. It's very, very important from a product perspective that really goes into their values. We want to make sure that we are providing that type of uh, messaging and, and, and product to those individuals. And they also want something that's practical, like as we mentioned, something that's practical, produces sustainability. So we know that we can start to show those particular items and those particular uh, personal tech devices to these individuals to say, hey, this is what we have and what we want to give to you. Uh, but now that I will, I will pass this back to Erica to get a CMO's perspective on everything we just covered. Thanks, Jeff. I think what we've learned so far is that yesterday's data is not going to help you make decisions for tomorrow. You need the freshest data that's continuously updated, and you need it in a platform so that you can attach it to your customers and prospects and know how to understand and act now. You got to ask yourself questions. Have my customers' attitudes changed? Right? How does that affect my business? When will consumers begin spending again in my category? Will they shift from online back to brick and mortar? Or will they stay online? Where and how can I best engage customers and prospects now versus before? How has their behavior changed in terms of social media? You heard you know, both Jeff and, and Tim talk about different channels that people have moved into. Behaviors have changed. Time spent online has changed. You know, people have shifted from linear TV to other places. <clears throat> and finally, are these changes short-lived or are they permanent? The only way to know is to have a hyper-relevant answer platform like Resonate Ignite. It's available on day one for you to understand everything that we talked about today. This information exists inside the platform when you log in, but it gets even more powerful when you bring your data in, your segmentation, your ongoing custom research, or research that we can connect for you, your mobile app data, third-party data, purchase data, and more. All of that comes in, and then you can understand about your customers, whether they're you know, live, people who live to bake consumer activists <laughs> or you know, electronic mavens. And you can easily push that out into your advertising channels for website personalization, for email personalization, even things like direct mail and modeling. All of that's available, very easy to go in and out. So there's a lot more to learn. You can, we can certainly talk endlessly about some of the really exciting data and research that we have. Um, but if you'd like to learn more about the state of the consumer, the state of your customer, resonate.com forward slash your customer is where you can get the latest research. And with that, I'll turn it back to Brian and see if we've got questions from the audience. Thanks, Erica. And we do, we have uh, several questions today. So it um, looks like we have about 15 minutes. We'll get through a few of these. And for any of you who uh, ask questions today, if we aren't able to uh, get to your question uh, live on the air, we will certainly reach back out um, with an answer to your question uh, via email. So uh, kicking things off here, it looks like I have one for Erica here. Um, it says, uh, the data on finding activist consumers based on media consumption is very interesting. Can it also show me uh, what web publishers or websites they are visiting most? Yes. So absolutely, we've got a wide variety of online and offline media consumption. So we can tell you not only um, things like online newspaper, you know, newspapers and, and magazines and other sort of offline channels, we can also tell you things that we shared, social media, the type of TV, the TV shows that they watch. And even beyond that, we can get into some of the brand affinities and website affinities um, that we talked about uh, throughout some of the examples that we gave today. So yes, all that information is available. 
Great, and I, I do just want to say that I am getting a, a lot of questions here about um, whether or not the slides will be available uh, after the presentation. So I do want to let everybody know um, that everyone who attended today, uh, we will be sending you uh, access uh, to this presentation uh, after the presentation ends. So yes, you will have access to these slides. Um, so that said, I have a question here for, it looks like it's best for Tim maybe. Um, it says that uh, you're saying that I can upload uh, my consumer data on the Resonate platform and connect it um, to audiences. Uh, can I do that to some of the same audiences uh, that you shared today? Uh, yeah, you can. So um, we realize that cl clients rely on a variety of first party data as well as some third party data from data marketplaces that they might be used to. Uh, we designed the platform so that all of that existing data can be brought into the platform integrated with the rest of our data sets um, and used to produce some of the, the insights and findings that Jeff and Erica and I shared. Great, and then I, it looks like there was a piece of the question I left off at the end there, but uh, uh, the, the asker was wondering if they could also uh, develop custom audiences uh, using the platform. Yeah, um, yes, I think, you know, the way I think about our platform is a lot of profiles and things are, are, are kind of top down, you know, it kind of gives you a, a description of someone and then tells you everything else about them. With our data, we really build it from the ground up. So you can take individualized data points like I did with my live to bake activist and kind of pick and choose the data points that are most important to you to serve which use case that you want. So uh, that's a long-winded answer of, of saying, yes, it's designed to be um, combinable with existing Resonate data. Great, fantastic. Uh, and it looks here like this question is probably best suited for Erica, but um, it says that uh, I saw some congressional districts uh, that were listed in uh, one of the analyses. Um, can you tell me more about the geotargeting capability with Resonate? Also, um we showed two different flavors of geo. We did see, show congressional districts. We also showed DMAs and Jeff's example. And so, yes, you are able to look at this data at a variety of um, geographic segments for targeting, depending on how you are operating. So that data is available in the platform. Great. Uh, I have a question here about the tech buyer. So that uh, looks like it's most suited for Jeff. Um, in that tech buyer example, uh, you talk about networks that were watched often. But can Resonate tell me uh, how much time they're spending on each of these networks? For example, uh, are they watching CNN more than an hour a day or PBS for more or less than 10 minutes? Yes, absolutely. Um, our media consumption taxonomy is very much uh, uh, very robust. And what we can get down to is, you know, not even on just the time they spend watching TV on a weekly basis, but also when uh, are they actually watching those TV insights. So we've been able to get even down to day parting to really understand when we're trying to create that media plan, what time of day do we know that they're going to be watching TV so we can deliver that message. So not only are they heavy TV watchers um, or across other media channels, but even down to uh, the time that they are also watching as well. Fantastic. And I have another one here that looks like it's uh, best for Tim as it cites the baking audience. Uh, it says, for the baking audience or any of the audiences, um, will I be able to see uh, their media consumption even if they're a custom audience that I bring uh, bring on board? Uh, yeah, yep. So uh, that kind of ties into, I think, the previous answer, uh, which is all of the data is, is designed to be customizable, interchangeable, and um, all those reports that we showed and all the insights get produced automatically inside the platform. Uh, and media consumption, obviously, is is one of those. Gotcha. And then I have a question here. Um, looking at it, it talks about sports interaction. So, okay, this one is uh, most suited for Jeff. Um, do you have uh, insights or reasons why across other variables uh, than just live sports interaction during the pandemic? I thought that that example was really interesting. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that was just one data point, but the, you know, within the, the, the Resonate taxonomy, we get down to those values and those purchase drivers and to their behaviors and why they are doing, um, you know, the actions they're doing online. So across, you know, not even just from a media perspective, but from, you know, from travel to financial, the reason what they're looking for, what they care about, why they're making these decisions, um, you'll be able to get down to that and answer those uh, questions uh, within the platform. 
Awesome. Uh, another question. Um, this one refers actually to typing tools. Uh, might be best for Erica here. Can uh, and the question is, can segmentation uh, get brought in through a typing tool? Yes, absolutely. In fact, um, we have a lot of clients that do that. You, you obviously, you know, look, you take a lot of effort uh, goes into your segmentation strategy, and um, you know, most brands now I think are are back on really refreshing their segmentation. It's, it's certainly something, if you haven't done it recently, you really do want to take a look at not only revisiting the segments you have, but maybe perhaps you know, establishing some new micro segments based on some of the things that we talked about today. But if you have done a segmentation strategy recently and you, know, you have a typing tool, it's very easy for us at Resonate to take your typing tool and apply that to larger groups. Um, perhaps, you know, new audiences that you've got, um, uh, apply it to your mobile app, for example, people that are in your mobile app, you know, essentially classifying people into those segments. Um, I, so the only other thing I'd say about segmentation is we do find a lot of our clients actually discover new segments in um, the work that they do with us. When they onboard data, particularly things like your website, for example, you may discover new segments that you didn't even realize you had um, or things about segments that you thought you knew pretty well that give you, you know, an advantage when engaging those segments. So segmentation is really, really critical and now more than ever to really be um, hyper relevant and, and, and highly targeted micro segments. And so taking your typing tool and extending it is a great way um, to, to really reach and understand the audience better and, and you know, also do some, some segment discovery as well. Fantastic. And um, as we're going to be coming up on about five of and not too long, I want to ask uh, at least one more here. Uh, this one looks like it's mostly suited for you, Erica, as well. Um, and the question is, uh, do you have data on uh, the brands that have staked out activist positions and how perceptions towards those brands may have changed among consumers uh, from before to after that activism? Uh, so, yes, we do. We have we do have a lot of brand specific data um, across a wide variety of industries and categories. Um, we may not have every brand uh, that, that we're talking about, every product brand and sub brand, right? If you think about it, it could be anywhere from, um, you know, your product name to your, to your overarching brand, but we do have a lot of brand data and it's easy for us to um, look at that, that data, you know, before and after, because we've been in market, we are able to really um, see how things have evolved. I think that's probably one of the most fascinating things as a as a marketer is just to see how consumers are changing and evolving in in a, a wide variety of things. How they feel about your brand, how they feel about stores. Um, it's really really interesting. So uh, there's a I, I would I would point you to two different directions. One I would say please go and look at some of the latest research on social justice and COVID-19. It's a great place to start if you haven't seen that research. Um, it's trend data that was, will be very revealing to you um, if you are interested in learning more about your brand it's, it's easy to um you know reach out to us and we can definitely you know look and give you data about your brand um just to get you started and of course hopefully to be a customer of ours and i would say the last thing i'd say is if if we don't have your brand um we also have contextual studies that give us a chance to find uh people uh who who are reacting to your brand and really actually conduct primary research that way for you so i think one thing we don't talk about that often here at Resonate is our ability to do custom studies. And so the benefit of working with us in a custom study, whether it's um, a pure um, survey research or if it's a contextual study, um, we can easily marry all of um, your proprietary questions and the answers to those questions to all of the data that we've just described. So those 13,000 plus additional attributes. And so that's really you know what we could do for brands that don't already exists in our taxonomy. You could, you could easily launch a contextual study or even a custom study, which gives you a much more than just survey answers, um, a really robust sort of platform for you to leap and, and understand a lot more than just those answers to the question. So um, there's a lot we can do with understanding your brand in particular. Fantastic. Thank you. And I do just want to add a quick note there. So, you know, some of those resources uh, being mentioned, especially around um, uh, COVID-19, um, you can find those on the Resonate website uh, under the resources tab, uh, which will be right across the top, um, and they'll all be listed there. Um, also, uh, I did want to thank everyone uh, for joining us today since we're at about 
uh, four to the top of the hour. Uh, any questions that uh, we weren't able to get to, uh, again, we will um, individually uh, recognize and respond to via email. Um, but again, thank you for joining us today. A special thanks to our speakers for such a fantastic discussion. Um, for all attendees, as noted, this webinar will be available on demand uh, and you can access a variety of fresh data and insights on your customers in 2020 at resonate.com forward slash your customer. We hope that you all have a great rest of your day and upcoming weekend. Thank you.